So in the series so far, we have discussed a number of aspects of why the information ecology is broken, why it is so hard to make sense of what's really going on in the world, why people are coming to such kind of radically polarized positions on almost everything, and a little bit of why that's really consequential for our ability to make good choices or do anything if we have a hard time coming to even a, a base shared understanding of what is. Uh, in this one, near the end, we're going to get into a project we're working on that has been a pretty central focus for how to start to repair the information ecology that we are hopeful about, excited about, and want to invite people to uh, participate in. But we want to start by spending the first chunk kind of recapping the problem space, hopefully making it more succinct, clear, and maybe addressing a few parts that we haven't uh, so far. When COVID came, a lot of people were hoping that that could be a shared enemy for the whole world. It could unite the world. A virus is almost like an alien invader, right? That isn't, it isn't a human, it isn't even like us. It, we're all threatened by it. Can we all unite together to share scientific info and production of uh, medical supplies and those types of things? I remember that that was like a very naive hope that a number of people were suggesting at the very beginning of COVID that might come from this. And I think we've seen almost as far from that as we can see. We've seen polarization on how to handle it in almost every country and between countries um, and on almost every subtopic, whether it's hydroxychloroquine or masks or shutdown or vaccines, there's kind of polarization across the whole space. We've seen the entire global order has already shifted, right? U.S.-China relations were already tense, but they got very magnified in this situation. Uh, the Tensions in the EU got very magnified. The relationships between the EU and Eastern Europe, those tensions got magnified. So um, I think COVID was just a big enough issue to start to set off the systemic fragilities that were already in place. So yeah, I think we were sitting right here having this conversation, I don't know, a year ago or something uh, before COVID. And we were talking about the breakdown in sense making that was already occurring, making it uh, increasing the speed at which systemic fragility was um, being actuated and at which catastrophic risk was impending. But then since COVID and then since the riots and the fires and the um, so many types of dynamics, increased militarized tension in various parts of the world, I think everyone feels quite differently about it. They, they have a sense of not just that some people are saying there might be impending catastrophe, but that we're in the process of that and that it's not just within one area, it's cascading. And so what I wanna talk about here today is not just, okay, there's all these problems, but why is our assessment of the problems one of the main causes of the problems themselves and the worsening of the problems? I mean, what would it take for us to have a kind of shared assessment that makes solutions possible at all? If we take almost any issue and say, what are the most consequential issues facing the world today? What are the things that are both hottest in the news cycle and possibly most consequential? And we start to list them. And we say, which of those is there fairly good consensus across the space of citizens on? It's like almost nothing, right? And not only is there not consensus, but there is nearly maximum polarization that is felt to be nearly maximally consequential, which is a basis for not just social tension, but a movement towards warfare. If you think about the upcoming US elections right now, I would say that we're in a situation that is unprecedented in the history of all of our lifetimes and pretty much unprecedented in the history of the nation is everyone has always felt that presidential elections are consequential. Maybe they've even felt that they're more consequential than they really are and they get passionate about it. But right now, the percentage of the population that thinks that it's not just consequential, this election, but is existential to the Republic itself is very high. Like it's a very high percentage of the population that think the way this election goes will be either the end of the nation or the possibility of it to continue on both sides, right? So like to, to really get a sense, the Trump supporters feel that Trump is the only thing standing between the Republic being protected and the people being protected at all and a kind of globalist deep state cabal taking everything over in a f finalizing way and running the benign China hypothesis like they did in DC since the 70s and basically ceding control of the world to China and that kind of thing. The, the never Trumpers think that if Trump gets in, he will eviscerate the last 
elements of a republic and create a dynasty kind of for his family and chosen people to run it. Like they both think that it's the end of the republic if the other guy gets in and they both think the other side is going to steal it. They're set up to actually think that there isn't election security and it's going to be stolen. So what happens when the election comes and it's not held as valid and it's held as existential and we have these mounting tensions already that were there with COVID because of lockdown. Lockdown means more news cycle to take all this stuff in, right? Um, and then also it means radically increasing unemployment. And we, so when we saw the violence start with George Floyd, violence was actually bound to start from some trigger. Uh, when you study kind of the societal um, chaos indices, the things that would create a basis for societal chaos, the more people whose fundamental needs aren't met by a system, they become more desperately willing to act against the system. And so when you start having massive unemployment, that's a very unstable situation for the overall system. And that's going to express itself somehow. And no one really has the ability to process any of this well, nor are the nor is the reporting oriented to try to process it in an adequate way, which is actually a really hard thing to do. There's a much higher incentive to control a narrative for particular purposes. And so for the most part, people have kind of traded epistemology for tribalism, meaning given up on trying to do a rigorous job of making sense of things themselves, like take a narrative, take a QAnon narrative, take an Antifa narrative, break it into individual propositions, and then look at each of those propositions what evidence do I have to verify it or falsify it? Maybe neither. Do I have any evidence that would at least support or refute it? Do other people interpret that evidence differently? Go across the whole thing, then look at alternate hypotheses. Nobody does that, right? Like very, very few people use formal epistemic process. So what they're really doing is paying attention to what feels true, which largely has to do with what people like me kind of seem to think and which team I kind of want to be on and what I'm getting exposed to the most. Let's just take a historical perspective for a minute. Humans have been here for a long time, but the thing that we call civilization, which was much larger than tribal scale, starting to organize, early Egypt or Sumeria or whatever, since the beginning of that larger scale coordination, a tiny percentage of the people that ever lived, lived in something like a republic or a democracy. They almost all lived in uh, feudalism or monarchy or some kind of much more top-down autocratic system, which is actually quite easy to understand because the proposition of a republic or a democracy, a, a participatory governance, is actually a wild proposition, which is that a huge number of people who don't know each other, who want different things, can sublimate their desire and difference to coordinate with each other. It's like, that's actually kind of, oh, it's understandable that's a hard thing, right? This is why corporations aren't run that way. Corporations are autocracies. And so the few times throughout history that a republic or a democracy emerged, they're actually really kind of worth studying. Uh, and I'm going to simplify here, but it's, it's a fair simplification. They emerged following a period of a cultural enlightenment for that culture. And the cultural enlightenment's always had at least a couple things in common. So if we look at the kind of early Greek democracies, the Athenian democracy, of course we can criticize that there's a lot that wasn't perfect about it, but it was a movement in the direction of more participatory governance. It was following the kind of Greek enlightenment that both had a very high value on classical education for everyone. Let's have everybody learn history. Let's have them all learn philosophy. Let's have them all learn formal logic and rhetoric and the arts and these types of things so that everyone can have a sense of the, how to know the true plus the good and the beautiful, right? Like all of it, an integrated sense of those understand what types of systems worked and didn't work in the past because of more kind of knowledge of history. So if everyone can basically sense base reality on their own well, which has to be trained, right? Like you, there's actually training involved in that. And then there was also the value of the Socratic dialogue. And in the Socratic dialogue, everybody is being trained to be able to take every perspective. I can argue this side, then I can move around and argue this side. If people are being trained in that kind of dialectical process. That means I'm being trained in seeking to understand the perspective of others and actually be able to argue them even better, which is steel manning, right? Well, if you have a bunch of people who can all understand reality on their own well, and they can have high quality conversations and take each other's perspective, not just go into tribalism and otherness and make a villain or a straw man of the other, 
those people can start to have the kinds of conversations to share sense making that leads to being able to make collective choices. And then they don't need rulers and they can say like, we can throw the rulers off and do a participatory governance system. The European Enlightenment, which led to the foundation of the US and a reformation of a lot of kind of European and other global governance, the kind of modern era, similarly was the Renaissance, right? The idea that people would be Renaissance men or Renaissance people who actually train in lots of disciplines, not just be, be specialists. Because it's very hard if someone's just a specialist to make sense of the world, right? And or for them to talk to each other across those specialist languages. Uh, so the idea of Renaissance person and then of natural philosophy and science that we can actually empirically tell what's going on and have the same conversation based on that, plus kind of the Hegelian dialectic. We can seek a thesis and then seek an antithesis and then see is there a higher order synthesis. If people can do that well, a town hall is a possible thing and a republic or a democracy or participatory government governance is a possible thing. If that starts to break down where people can't actually make sense of reality on their own well. So they're taking the view of authorities who can then be captured because of the power of that and used for power purposes. And they can't take the view of other people well. They can only basically make straw men and fight against them. There is no possibility for collective choice making, which is what a democracy or republic is about, collective choice making. If there's no capacity for collective, the, right, the antecedents of choice making is collective sense making, collective meaning making and collective conversation, collective sense making of what's actually going on. And what do we anticipate the effects of a particular action to be? Collective meaning making of what's important. Well, we're focused on different things that are important. Can we factor all of them and try to come up with a design solution that is good for all of them? Right now, we don't even have a process in democracy for that. We have somebody's focused on something. They come up with a proposition to benefit that. They don't even think about the fact that that proposition harms other things because they're focused on the subset of values they're focused on, which is why almost no proposition gets 100% or 0% of the vote. It's like 50% because the people who are focused on what it benefits really want it, and the people who are focused on what it harms really don't want it that inherently and unavoidably polarizes the population against each other. Because I see the thing that you are desperately trying to make happen is actively harming the thing that I hold as sacred and worth fighting for. So I have to hold you as an enemy, right? But it was because of a dumb proposition. It was because of a proposition that didn't even try to get, hey, you don't necessarily need that economic thing to go through or that tax policy or that oil policy. You need your kids to be able to have an opportunity for a real job and to be able to own a house someday, like not be in, in economic servitude forever. Well, if I hold just what is the value without the strategy that's attached to it, that contextualizes it having it happen that way, I'm like, that's fair. I, economic servitude's a problem. And I don't hold that that thing can't go through. I hold that we don't want an extinct species in this area. You're like, I actually like forests. Not extincting species would be cool. I just, I'm willing to do it if that's the only way my kids aren't in servitude forever. If we start by taking the what are the values that everyone holds and say, is there a proposition that does a better job of meeting these? And can we use some collective sense making for collective design? Well, it's like that's so obvious once you say it. And that's not in our democratic process at all. But it also requires people that can have a good quality conversation and seek to hear what other people's values are and would want to seek not just the immediacy of war, which then of course, you never just win forever, right? You win and the thing that won, the other side reverse engineers makes better and comes back. And so then you just get an arms race and an escalation of narrative warfare, info warfare, mimetic warfare, tribalism, physical kinetic warfare, all of those types of things. You know, when we say that most people throughout the history of civilization haven't lived in democracies and that, or republics and that when those have occurred, they've occurred following periods of cultural enlightenment, they also then haven't lasted very long, right? Historically, they've lasted 300 years at most, most of the time. And of course, every empire breaks down. No empire lasts forever, which is one of the kind of key insights is that right now we have a fully globalized system and it's in the process of breakdown where all of the previous systems did break down, but they were localized. And so the, the consequence of this is different in kind. Uh, but the democracies break down much faster than many of the dynasties and other types of top-down systems because it's just easier for a small number of people to coordinate with each other than a large number of people, right? You think about it, it's kind of like if somebody is a bodybuilder, it takes a lot of work to keep that much muscle on, right? They have to be working out and eating all the time. And the moment they stop, it starts breaking down because it's it's actually very expensive. Well, it's actually very expensive to keep a whole population 
highly educated and highly engaged, not just kind of in their own life, but really paying attention. Like most people don't want to go to jury duty. They don't go to town halls. They don't really want to pay attention to the issues well. And this is part of why the breakdown occurs is if somebody works very hard to fight a revolutionary war against a tyrant or to try and overthrow a tyrannical system of governance or whatever, they have an embodied knowledge of what the bad alternative is. And they work very hard to make sure their kids have that. So that's why a Washington or a Franklin would say those types of things, right? Like that it's utterly necessary for everyone to have this kind of comprehensive education because they know what the alternative is. But as time goes on and three generations pass and four do, the idea of a monarchy or of a totalitarian system or whatever is just not even a thing. We don't have any embodied relationship to it. We aren't scared of it. It doesn't motivate us to do the very hard work to understand how to be actively engaged citizens. And there's stuff on TV, right? And there's like stuff to do and there's social interests and there's whatever else. And so there is a lack of generational knowledge transfer of the real critical issue that someone fought hard to form a new system. So the basis of what it takes to make that system ends up breaking down. And we can see we are at a place where this, this is not a system of for and by the people. The people at best every four years get riled up over a person that they didn't really have much to say in which people were even there or what they do propositionally or anything else. Um, and so what I would say is, you know, the U.S. is at about 250 years since it was founded. They don't make it past 300 years. This one has had more pressure to break down on it because since World War II in the Bretton Woods world, it's been the center of a global order. So everyone who's wanted to change the global order has had a maximum incentive to try to influence D.C. in various directions. And it's not that hard to flow money into the DC structure internationally towards whatever your personal interests are. It's not that hard for a foreign actor, a state actor or non-state actor to be able, it's, so it's not just economic capture within the country, it's also international. And this is not just for the US, this is everywhere. The US is, just happens to be a kind of central example right now. But it's not that hard to have money go from a sovereign wealth fund or something like that into an international IGO or NGO into a corporation in the US that. Uh, has certain kinds of veils and protections or a nonprofit into the Washington DC think tank nonprofit P uh, political action campaign complex and start to purchase legislators and uh, get senators invested in doing the bidding of particular things and whatever else. And so <clears throat> when both the left and right feel like the nation is on the brink of existential collapse, they're right. The integrity of the thing actually is their answer as to what the solution is isn't right. So this, this one will not continue to have the, to actually be a republic and be able to help influence the rest of the world in a positive direction. It just won't. It is in kind of a decay process. The question is whether it decays into uh, just less and less function and irrelevance or whether it decays and reboots. And if we reboot an actual kind of meaningful participatory governance, and um, obviously that's a US question, but it's a global question. And in order to do that, a cultural enlightenment as a prerequisite is, is necessary, right? The cultural enlightenment of, is everyone recognizing that collective choice making has to be based on collective sense making, collective meaning making, collective conversation? And are we starting to really invest not in doubling down on our own bias, but in the capacity to make sense of things well, the capacity to understand why other people are thinking the things that they do and what signal is in there and what noise is in there and the capacity to communicate well so we can coordinate. Either that becomes a widespread value that we start investing in and training in, or it will devolve into autocracy and we should actually put attention on trying to pick how to make it a better monarchy than a worse one. Benjamin Franklin, I believe, said something to the effect of, uh, if I could have a government without a newspaper, a newspaper without a government, I would pick the newspaper. And the reason is, and of course he was talking about an independent high quality fourth estate that creates an information commons. Information commons or epistemic commons is an important concept that I think everybody needs to have, which is um, when we think of the commons, we think about some shared 
aspect of the world that is both a resource that we have shared access to, but also some shared stewardship of. We don't have very good commons management today in lots of ways, and we can see tragedy of the commons type dynamics because of that. But we think of the air as an example of a commons or the ocean or whatever. Well, the information commons is what is the, what is the space of information out there about what is true that informs our capacity to make choices? And we can see that just like a smokestack billowing pollution into the air, most of what is being put into the information commons is pollution, right? It's a lot of noise and not true stuff or stuff that is partially true with spin to advance some agentic interests. Because most interests, when they're communicating, are communicating to get people to believe something that is useful for them. And particularly, the more powerful they are, they use that asymmetric power to both maintain and increase their asymmetric power. We can see that since COVID, like the markets crashed and then they bounced back up, but employment hasn't correspondingly gone back up. Real production in the underlying market and real wealth of the people relative to, to uh, their purchasing power hasn't gone up. A few billionaires wealth has you know, radically gone up. So we see the both radical power asymmetry represented in finance um, and the decoupling of the actual you know, uh, economy and the market. So the information commons is the thing we're talking about here. And in some ways, I would say the information commons is more important than the other ones to pay attention to because it's the basis of why any of us would make the choices we would that would determine how we affect the air or the ocean or war or anything else. And so I would say the quality of the information commons is requisite. And that is both like the quality of public education and the quality of media news. And you can see in all the kind of founding documents for this country, those were both considered prerequisites for the ongoing protection of the republic, that there would be very high quality public education where everyone learned the civics necessary to really participate and a independent high quality fourth estate so people could know what was going on currently so they could participate meaningfully and effectively. And we know that institutions decay for a number of reasons, and we've seen radical decay in the fourth estate and in public education and in kind of government writ large as a result. It's also important to understand that it's not just that democracies and republics require high quality information, even markets do. If you read Ayn Rand uh, and other kind of laissez-faire market ideology, it talks about the need for um, accurate and symmetrical information for the rational actors to be able to make good choices in the market, right? The, the idea that a rational actor can see all of the information and make a good choice, and as a result, the best products and services at the best price are what get upregulated. Well, if I'm not, if I can't see all the things, because there's way too many of them, and so then the algorithms that determine what I see end up uh, affecting my choice. And if I'm not actually a rational actor doing really good sense making that has the info to compare what a better product or service is, whoever does better marketing that emotionally compels me ends up winning rather than better product and service. So the system starts to incent extraction over real production value. So all of our large systems of coordination, whether they're more state-like systems or market-like systems, require accurate and symmetrical information for people to make good choices. So if we, if we think about how have humans ever thought about coordinating at scale? There's a bunch of models that different social scientists have put together. I'll share one, there, but there's different ways of thinking about it. So we don't need to attach too hard, but you'll kind of get the gist. There are market type mechanisms for large scale coordination. There are uh, government or state-like mechanisms and there are culture-like mechanisms. And we can kind of define all those differently, but market type mechanisms mean um, some kind of distributed bottom-up type system where the agreement happens point to point, not as a systemic agreement across the whole space and the topology is emergent. And whether it is uh, a formal religious organization or a state or some kind of commons agreement, uh, then you have the government type mechanisms that have some top-down collective agreement type structure. Those are kind of different architectures. But then you have like culture and by culture here, because that word means different things in different places, I mean, what are the collective values that people hold and the collective worldview and ways of making sense that would determine, say, in a government, what laws should be made, right? Because uh, law is really a codification of an ethical system. 
ethics is then not part of the market or part of the state formally, but is supposed to be guiding and binding them. And so we can think of that as kind of like a culture. And so if you think about those three and how they're supposed to interact uh, in the idea of like our current system, a liberal democracy of some sort, roughly, is that most of the innovation will happen and most of the exchange of goods and services and the kind of flow of resource and resource allocation will happen in the market. But the reason that we have a liberal democracy that has a state as opposed to just a pure market, and many people will talk about this reason differently, but like the kind of foundational reason that is argued for is that markets will have a market for human trafficking or for organ harvesting or for organized crime or maybe to cut all the wood in an area down and there's no state park left or whatever it is. So there can be perverse incentives in markets that are good in the short term, but really bad in the long term, or good for some people, bad for others. And so we say, okay, there are some things, market does innovation and production well, but it also does extraction and kind of pathological stuff. So we want to bind the predatory aspects of market. Well, how do we do that? Well, we'll make a state and we'll give it this thing called rule of law. And then we'll give it this thing called monopoly of violence, which is the police force internally that can, so we make a national forest, right? So we're not going to cut down the trees here. We can cut down the trees here, but not here. And then if someone goes and is cutting the trees down there, the cops are gonna show up. And if those guys have guns, the cops have bigger guns. The monopoly of violence, because without enforcement, law doesn't really mean anything, right? It's just kind of a suggestion. And then incentive is still gonna be the thing that runs it. So this is a system that supposedly, rather than based on incentive, can bind predatory incentive. So the purpose of the state primarily is to check the predatory aspects of market, where people would have an incentive to do something that we kind of collectively want to agree is not a thing to do. But then the people are supposed to bind and check the state. That's the idea of governance of, for, and by the people is how do we ensure that the, peop that the market interests where the money and the power is don't just uh, capture the regulatory interests and say, hey, change this thing in my benefit and your Swiss bank account will get filled up and you'll have a house to use in the Hamptons and whatever else. Well, the only way to ensure that you don't get regulatory capture is if there's enough transparency in government and the people are educated enough and actively involved that they get to see that the government is actually doing rule of law rather than other things. Think about how far the citizens here or pretty much anywhere are from being able to understand the issues that are happening at the level of federal government and actually have transparent insight and are actively involved in a way that would kind of police the thing. So of course then what happens is you do get regulatory capture because as the people aren't checking the state, the state stops checking the market, the predatory aspects of the market, the market starts to follow a power law distribution and those who have the most resources, who have asymmetric power, have both the capacity and the incentive to increase their asymmetric power. And that's through a bunch of things. It's through marketing and affecting the mindsets of the people. It's through affecting news and media, it's through the capture of regulatory systems, all of those different types of dynamics. And the last part of this system, so the state checks the market, the people check the state, then the market or the underlying economy itself checks the people, which means that the thing that the people want, the accounting actually has to work. They can't all want to extract more from the system than anyone is putting in. If you really think about that, there's actually a beautiful and kind of stabilizing complex geometry to it. But at the base of it is the capacity of the people as a whole to make good choices. And whether it's how they're acting in the market, how they're acting in the state, um, checking it, if people can't make sense of the types of issues that the world is facing and that the states will be making choices on and that the markets are affecting, if they can't make sense of that well and they can't communicate about it well, all of those systems start to be captured. Lying is not a new thing, right? Putting spin on information isn't a new thing. Being wrong about stuff isn't a new thing. Uh, and intentionally being able to try to control the narrative for purposes, narrative warfare and information warfare aren't new things. You can read about them in Sun Tzu and other you know, thousands of year old military doctrine texts of how to control the population through making false enemies and through deception and whatever. So this has always been a thing. And like very active disinformation. How do you have uh, some of your messengers have a, 
uh, message about what the attack plan is that you know they'll get captured so that the other side gets what the secret intel is and the whole thing was a farce to get them to make the wrong choice. Like thousands of years old craftiness around this stuff. But we've also then worked on counter strategies. How do we come divergent and as vehement? And so it has been degrading. There's a bunch of reasons, I won't cover all of them, but I will address a couple of the main ones so people understand it, because the solution space requires understanding the problem space. That's actually a general kind of principle of sense-making, is uh, the saying by Charles Kettering, if you, um, a problem fully understood is half solved. But that also means a problem not fully understood is pretty much unsolvable. And so we typically have very superficial understandings of problems, don't understand the, the generator and the etiology of them well enough and what they're connected to, and we try to jump straight to solutions. And so the solutions are either gibberish or actually bad. Um, and then engender counter responses for understandable reasons. So um, to try to understand the problem of the breakdown and sense making a little more so we can think about adequate solutions. One of the biggest things and this has been talked about on Rebel Wisdom before, I believe you've had Tristan Harris on, who talks about this very centrally, is the movement from news being largely broadcast media uh, mediated to decentralized media mediated, which was the internet, and then not just the internet, but um, the large internet information curation platforms, uh, Facebook in particular, but also YouTube and various other ones. It's important to understand why this is such a big deal, is all of our global institutions evolved in the context of broadcast media, right? From the printing press, through the telegram, to the radio, to the TV, it was still a small number of groups being able to have some narrative on what's true and be able to broadcast it and everybody get that. Now, of course, that means it was susceptible to very centralized control and capture. But at least when everybody was watching CNN, they at least all saw the same base reality and they could agree or disagree. Maybe they were informed or misinformed, but there was at least some basis of what they were being exposed to. Because right now people are really riled up over issues that they have no on the ground knowledge of, right? Like they, they weren't on the ground where the shooting was. They weren't in Beirut. They aren't in North Korea, they, so their sense of what's going on is mediated through the media, right? Through what's coming through this kind of 2D screen. And so there was in broadcast at least a sense of shared base information about the world beyond my own experience, my own direct experience. As soon as we started to get to, and you know, the internet, there was this very libertarian, beautiful idea that it would democratize broadcast. So rather than a few billionaires being able to control broadcast, you could go to YouTube and everybody could broadcast. And so it would democratize the ability to share information. And then if it was true that we had a kind of a market of rational actors who would parse the information and upregulate the signal of the best stuff, wouldn't that be awesome? Of course, nearly the exact opposite thing happened because so much broadcast gets put up that I Google something and I get a billion search results for anything. Well, I can never read through a billion search results to be a rational actor and make sense of the, that entire space, nor can I do the deep parsing on any one of those things. So then, of the billion search results, which ones do I actually see? That became one of the big problems, was how do we curate the content to show people the stuff that they want to see? Well, now that starts to become a big problem. So you get something like Facebook, for instance, having a tremendous amount of ability to harvest very particular information about me that is unique to me, not just even a demographic. Whereas the broadcast news on a TV didn't have that. It could tell if I turned it on or turned it off and that was about it. But I wasn't interacting with it in a way that could give me a tremendous, could give them a tremendous amount of personalized micro-targeting information. But now I'm on Facebook and what I like and what I share and what I comment on, what my mouse hovers over, the analytics of all of that are such that after I've done about 300 likes, Facebook can predict what I will like better than my spouse. And after I've gone further, it actually has a psychographic profile on me that is asymmetric to anything that any human, CIA agent or whatever, could have ever had previously. And th that was co-occurring with I'm carrying my cell phone around all the time that is both tracking stuff that I'm doing and using notifications to give me a continuous feed. So there's a radical increase in the amount of input into my mind space and the amount of data being harvested about me across platforms to be able to micro-target of those billion things which ones I should see. Now it happens to be that we think of Facebook or YouTube or whatever as a tool, but it is actually a corporate interest that has agency 
that is not just a tool. And so those corporations make money by selling advertising, selling information, and they sell more advertising by maximizing my engagement and maximizing my time on site. Well, I don't wanna spend that much time scrolling Facebook because I have shit to do. So if I stay in my kind of prefrontal rational cortex, I will check it real quickly and then go because I have stuff to do. But I'll spend more time if I get limbically hijacked, if I get into social FOMO of like, am I gonna miss out on what's happening or if I get outraged or scared or whatever it is. So, um, and I'm also not gonna spend as much time on stuff that is totally foreign to me as stuff that I already know is important. So what happens is the AI that is paying attention to what I engage with the most, that is curating all of the information on Facebook or the internet to me is curating what is stickiest. And what is stickiest is a very much like foods that are addictive are usually bad for you. Salad's not that addictive. French fries are much more addictive. Information that is maximally sticky is usually actually because it is appealing to dopaminergic hijacks. So what it curates for is a combination of bias and limbic hijack, which is outrage, group identity, and certainty. And so now what we have is a situation where because there's so much stuff, so much total stuff online, the curation platforms, and it's important to understand that the AIs that are doing that are radically more powerful than the AI that several years ago beat Kasparov at chess. Like a much more powerful game theoretic AI than that that is controlling the information feed of what I believe to try to maximize stickiness. And I don't even realize I'm playing that game, right? So this is an asymmetric information warfare that is unlike the asymmetry that ever could exist in the past. This is so many orders of magnitude more asymmetric. And so I might have someone who is in Oakland who they look on their Facebook feed and they just see cops killing black people, like their whole Facebook feed is this, and people who are recognizing it and outraged by it, and then kind of what looks like Klan and Nazi members, and because that actually maximizes their time on site and their sharing and engagement that maximizes other people's time on site. And I might have somebody in Texas, Trump supporting, and all they see is people wrongly attacking cops and black on black violence and black on white violence. And both of these people are getting vicariously traumatized by what they're seeing to the point that they're having trauma reactions and they feel like it's a war zone and they have to pick up arms and go out into the street. And neither of them are getting statistical representation of the entire space, right? And I can scroll for an hour and I just keep seeing more of it. So it seems like it's everything, but I'm not even seeing 0.001% of the total. So everybody's getting increased certainty, outrage, trauma, and wider apart from each other right? This is actually really um, important. Where those two people, I might be able to scroll through both of their news feeds for 10 hours and not find a single piece of news in common. So the opposite of everybody seeing CNN, now it seems certain that the, all the people that I know think like me. And all the people that seem like they're making sense think like me. And the only version of the other I get is a pejorative straw man or villainized version. Well, of course, that tool by itself will break democracy, break republics, break the social fabric of civilization. It is like when we talk about AI risk, we're already dealing with AI risk that is destroying the fabric of civilization and driving all these other issues as second and third order effects. So that's a critical thing to understand. That's not the only thing that is current, but that's both the emergence of the internet and everyone being able to broadcast where there's no quality control. In the news before, there could be bad stuff, but there was at least some accountability of who it was, right? It was CNN or the BBC. So if they got something really wrong, there was at least some FTC or whatever that had quality control. Now, no quality control but radical amplification type possibilities. Uh, radical information about everyone to personally micro-target them to, to limbically hijack. And, and the cell phone, right? The continuous both monitoring and drip. That's the technological landscape change. Simultaneous to that, we also see that because of globalization and the extent of globalization, the issues that we're facing are more complex and more abstract than the issues we evolved to be able to face. So tribes didn't have to think about climate change and 
um, positive feedback effects on the hydrological cycles in the Amazon and albedo effects or grid stability. Like these are huge and they're, they're hyper objects, which means an object I can see with my senses. A hyper object I can only conceptualize. I can't see climate change. I can see snow melt here, but snow melt here is very different than the abstract concept of climate change and positive albedo effect. The same with like, I can see a weapon, but I can't see nuclear risk writ large. Right? I can't see the information ecology writ large. So I can understand it, but we kind of didn't evolve to do that well. So we have to train ourselves to do it well or we, we won't. So we have a situation where all the biggest problems are hyper objects. They're very complex and they're interconnections of hyper objects and we're not trained at all for how to do that. That's another thing, right? So the issues are authentically more complex. The information ecology is oriented to bias reinforcement and limbic hijack. Bias reinforcement because I'm more likely to click on something that sounds important to me than something that sounds foreign to me. Sounds important means appeals to my existing understanding and value systems. So that inherently does bias reinforcement even without the intention to do so, right? And so it's not trying to drive political polarization, it's trying to drive profit and maximize time on site and political polarization and radicalization just happens to be a second order effect. Simultaneous to this is once you already have a media environment where people are having much more radicalized views, where it's so complex they give up on being able to sense make it themselves so that everyone kind of becomes an epistemic nihilist to some degree and chooses tribalism instead without even realizing they're doing that. Um, like what is the group that I want to be part of that seems more like me? What are the leaders that I just have a felt sense of trust in more? In that environment, it's also way easier for actors who want to do narrative warfare to do it. Let's say that we're talking about any other state actor or non-state terrorist actor that wants to decrease the power of the US. Now we can also see this is not just happening to the US, it's happening, the US was supporting the protests in Hong Kong, right? Like we've done this throughout the rest of the world. This is the nature of how warfare works but we'll look at this particular situation. You don't front on attack the country with the biggest military. You turn the enemy against itself. And it's not that hard to turn the enemy against itself when you already have an environment that is polarizing and doing that thing. All you have to do is just support the stuff the right believes to believe it even more. Just radicalize the stuff they already believe and that the left believes to believe it even more. So. This is where we start to see all these things about Chinese Twitter bots and Russian interference and whatever that other state actors are actually affecting the information ecology to be able to drive radicalization because that turning the enemy against itself weakens the entire empire, right? Now this is happening multi in a multipolar way across the whole thing. So it's not US versus China, it's radically multipolar. It's important to understand. The other part here is that even though none of the superpowers of the world, the major G8 or G20, whatever nations are in direct kinetic warfare today, I wouldn't say it's fair to say we're in peacetime either. Uh, the, maybe this is the last piece of history and then we can kind of move into the solution space. So throughout the history of the world, the major adjacent empires never had very long periods of peace. Like they, war was a part of how they dealt with conflict, right? And at World War II, something changed where we could never have large scale war between the major powers because our weapons were too big. It was too catastrophic. And so the post-World War II peace, the Bretton Woods world, is really unprecedented in the history of the world because the nuclear bomb is unprecedented in the history of the world. Until the nuclear bomb, we had the ability to like totally mess stuff up locally, but we didn't have the ability to kill life on earth, right? We didn't have the ability to induce existential risk. So that was the beginning of it. And that was like, from an evolutionary perspective, that's like a second ago, right? It's not much time that we got the bomb. And as a result, we said, oh shit, we can't ever have wars again between these major powers. So how do we do that? Well, it also happens to be that the tech that gave us the bomb gave us the capacity for globalization. So let's make a globalization based world where we're so economically interdependent that it's never profitable to go to war. It's more profitable to be in kind of trade and exchange with each other. Well, in a lot of ways that makes sense, right? And we haven't had another world war since then. So it's kind of made sense. But of course, what that also does is it means that you have a globalized rather than a bunch of localized systems. So failures anywhere can start cascading to failures everywhere. So the system as a whole becomes very fragile. It's very interconnected, but also very fragile. And we saw this with COVID. 
a virus in one area, could become a virus everywhere, could become increasing social unrest everywhere, could become breakdowns in supply chains everywhere, could become decoupling financial markets and economies everywhere. It's like, whoa, that's a very interconnected and fragile world where failures anywhere can cascade and there's gonna be failures in places. So the cascade potential is just very high. If you look at the agreements that were put in place in the Bretton Woods world to mediate peace, most of them have broken, right? We see the U.S. having pulled out of NATO. We see decreased support for the U.N. We see the having pulled out of the WHO, and not just during the Trump administration. It's been weakening for some time for a number of reasons. Um, so the and the large countries are actually doing cyber warfare on each other, and they know they're doing it. They're doing narrative warfare and economic warfare. So. Um, what I would say is that rather than say we're in peacetime, I would say that we're in kind of a multipolar war, but that is being fought as an unconventional rather than conventional war. So it's not being fought kinetically, though we see mounting kinetic capacity. We see the ramping up in the South China Sea, on the India-China border, on you know lots of places, uh, AI military drone technology as an arms race everywhere, um, space war uh, type phenomena. So, we're ramping the kinetic capacity, but mostly it's being fought through economic, diplomatic, info, narrative, cyber type war. And so in this situation where there is a movement from kind of peacetime agreements to something more like unconventional warfare, um, and from, in general, conventional to unconventional warfare as a more kind of primary tactic that has been happening over the last couple decades globally, then narrative and info warfare become some of the uh, most central parts of that overall picture. And especially in the info ecology where you can micro-target affecting people, right? The, the idea of stochastic terrorism, which is, let's say, I want to drive terrorism in an area because I want to turn the enemy on itself. I want to uh, damage the infidel or damage the social fabric of a place or whatever it is but I want plausible deniability to never have it traced to me. Well, I can go into a group that's radicalized with a sock puppet, right, with a fake kind of account um, as a international actor or a domestic actor, whatever, and just increase the radicalization through kind of support that looks pretty natural, right? In, be like, it, let's say it's an incel group or it's a, you know, Boogaloo group or an Antifa group, just be sharing more stuff that is of the type that outrages them, celebrate the people who go do the acts of violence more of what great heroes they are. And what'll happen is the already kind of on the edge, unhinged people in those groups that are, are close to tipping, now we tip them over, so we call it stochastic terrorism because I don't know who will do what harm when where, but I know that I'm increasing the pressure and the statistical likelihood that those harms occur with very, difficult time being able to trace that, right? So the social media kind of, uh, and, and algorithmic bias kind of thing, the uh, radical asymmetric information warfare, the lack of kind of information broadcast controls, uh, combined with the increase in narrative and info warfare, combined with the actual complexity of the problems, all of that is unique to the current situation. That the no, you know, Machiavelli didn't have to deal with these things as much as he had to deal with. Sun Tzu didn't have to deal with these things. And so uh, when we think about how do we solve any problems, the first thing we should be thinking is how do we understand the problems well enough to come up with good solutions? How do we make, those good, make sure those good solutions don't cause other problems so that we don't cause problems and so that other people who notice they cause problems don't resist the thing we're trying to do. So how do we come up with good solutions to the problem and the larger context of things that matter? And how do we sh make sure that enough of the world is in conversation of the right type and understanding in the right way that there's support for that? That should be the background of whether I care about social justice or the environment or wealth inequality, I should care about this as the basis for the possibility of effectiveness towards it. And so then we have to say, given these things that are messing up sense-making, what would it take to start to correct them? So what is the right relationship to the topic of free speech in general, and specifically in considering how deep the information ecology issues are to our capacity to address anything? So, 
uh, I'm not going to be able to give something like an adequate answer, but I will add complexity to the problem um, in the way we think about it here a little bit. So it's very easy to say free speech, free speech, no censorship, because uh, whoever has the censoring capacity then ends up just controlling everything. And we don't trust anyone that much. So free speech and let people figure it out. And we can see why historically, and there's a kind of in, in the left-right dialectic that is healthy, which we don't have, and the thing that's called left and right today don't actually mean anything, right? In the, in the US, in the counterculture movement in the 60s, the left was more for kind of radical speech and free speech, and the right had more desire to control certain things that they thought were communist or whatever. Now it's almost the exact opposite. The left has things that it wants to control that they consider hate speech. The right is more for free speech. So what we even mean by left and right are pretty broken, but let's try and take it to some foundational concepts of there are things like rights and responsibilities or traditionalism and progressivism that are both important, valuable, and should be in dialectic, meaning should be in some tension and in conversation where the right answer involves the consideration of their relationship, not one of the sides. But as soon as you move from dialectic between them to warfare between them, you stop seeking synthesis and you start seeking more um, double down versions of a partial view, right? So in the kind of traditional progressive thing, this is actually an important thing to understand. We should be traditionalists. Traditionalist means that there's kind of an intuition that the systems that worked for a very long time probably did for some good reasons. They probably, even though the people who are traditionalists are not thinking of it in evolutionary terms all the time, there's a sense of like, if there hadn't been some effectiveness and wisdom in it, it would have failed. And in a world where most of the other systems did fail. So why did some make it through? And we might be mistakenly thinking we understand the systems better than we do and why they worked. And we seek to change them when we're actually changing something that really worked for a long time for a reason. So let's kind of go back to the things that worked or let's at least make sure we protect the things that worked for a long time. That's kind of the traditional intuition, a simplified version of it. The progressive intuition is, we're facing new problems that we've never faced before. And the old solutions either were inadequate as they were, there were some people that did well and some that did really bad under it, and or even if they were adequate, they're not adequate to the changing landscape, so we need progress and evolution and adaptation. Well, of course those are both right, right? Like, of course we want to uh, pay attention to the things that worked and make sure we understand them very well before changing them, and most of the time we understand them less well than than we think. And in a new environment where there's new issues, we might need to assess these things quite differently and be able to add and be able to amend the situation. So we want a healthy dialectic, right, between uh, traditionalism and progressivism. So with regard to free speech here, there's a kind of traditional orientation that says, hey, founding fathers, constitution, total free speech. Well, in that environment, there wasn't Facebook, right? There wasn't uh, Twitter, YouTube, any of those types of things. Uh, if, if I'm in the 17th century, the 18th century, and I um, use my free speech to its maximum in that environment where I'm shouting in a town square, maybe a few hundred people hear what I have to say. And then they can actually talk with me. We can engage and we have more shared experience of base reality because we live in a similar area and have seen stuff, right? Now, if I share something where most of the people seeing it don't have the same shared experience, they don't live in the same area, maybe I say that I have privileged info, I saw this or whatever it was, and this can get amplified to be seen by millions or billions of people, that's such a different situation. So the way that uh, some people, Tristan talks about this, is that freedom of speech should not automatically equal freedom of reach. But it's not just freedom of reach, it's an algorithmic orientation to take the things that hijack people the most and upregulate those things. And so we don't see long, complex thought pieces trending anywhere near as much as we see emotionally charged, short, salacious, vehement things trending. And to understand any of these things well, they're complex enough that they need to be long and complex and kind of boring. We, like, but cognitively, we are not eating 
salads and healthy things. Cognitively, we're just eating french fries, right? Um, oriented to the maximum kind of dopaminergic hit. So uh, is the answer that everyone should just share everything in an environment that doesn't just allow them to broadcast but will amplify? Well, so now we can say, should the issue be freedom of speech or the regula regulation of those platforms? Now we start to get to the right level of granularity where we're realizing you can't think of freedom of speech independent of the media environment in which the things are being upregulated. So then we say, well, should we actually regulate freedom of speech? We've always thought that it was okay to have something like an FTC or an SEC that says you're not allowed to lie about your finances in this public filing or in this marketing. So we were okay with regulation on lying. But then as we trust the government less, the question is who is adjudicating what is a lie? And so in a situation right now where nobody really trusts at least half of the government or the other kinds of institutions, nobody would trust who's gonna say what fake news is because the left says the right's news is fake and the right says the left's news is fake and everyone says that the institutions that the other guy follows are, are the corrupted ones. So then the question of, well, who gets to adjudicate what is true? Well, that becomes the most powerful force in the world. And then all the most powerful forces have maximum incentive to become that and to capture it using all of the um, covert influence and whatever tools that they could possibly have to do that. So the, the, ins the easy censor answers and the easy just keep total free speech within this context answers are both silly, right? The issue is actually pretty complex. In order to be able to adjudicate, we need to trust the adjudication process. Well, that's again like a state regulating a market. Here it's a market of ideas. And it's a state that would maybe, like whether it's an SEC or an FTC that would be able to regulate, but you need a people who can regulate to make sure this is actually true and honest and doing an effective thing. So again, the basis of the answer is actually, again, a, col a collective enlightenment that has people who can sense make well enough to be able to say, how would we go about approaching these things? I think one of the reasons that I care about this issue so much and am, and am sensitized to it is I have experienced being very, very passionately certain about stuff that I later realized I was wrong about. And doing that enough times made me reflect on the meta thing of like, why was I so certain of that thing? Like so certain that I would go to info war over it, right? Battle with people on it. And then is the thing that I learned later that changed my mind, did it not exist yet? It didn't exist in my awareness, right? Like, and so my own fallibility in this way really kind of made me dubious of my own confidence and I started to, uh, and, and my epistemic process. And as I started to pay more attention to it, I was like, all right, I'm aware of places where I was wrong in the past. And I'm aware of where I think almost everybody else is wrong. But I actually can't say a single belief that I currently hold that I think I'm probably wrong about. Lots of other people can say what they think I'm wrong about. And in the future, I'm almost certain to think some of the stuff I think now is wrong unless I don't learn much. But if I'm on an evolutionary path where I'm actually learning a lot, a developmental path, I will almost certainly think some of my best thinking right now is naive or silly or underinformed or something. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with the fact that no one can name a belief they currently hold that they think is wrong? But they can name other people's, <laughs> even though they are statistically likely to be wrong about almost everything, at least partially wrong. That's a tricky thing, right? And um, there, it's very easy to have an emotional desire for certainty or for, for security that I get through a sense of certainty that orients me towards false premature certainty, especially given that we didn't evolve to process this type of and this much complexity and hyper objects and these types of things. And yet, these issues are catastrophic today. How to fix collective sense making is a big, hard topic and I absolutely can't say that myself or the groups that I work with or anyone I know has the whole thing figured out. Uh, it's why I want more people to understand both how significant the problem is, how much it affects all the other problems that you care about and how it's upstream to those, and some of the factors contributing to it so that more collective intelligence starts working on various aspects of the solution. Uh, there are 
there's a project that we're working on right now um, that is hopefully getting within a, a few months of being able to have a minimum viable product offered. And I'll share a little bit about it here, um, largely because we're actually seeking help. And if people who are here are, uh, have some capacity and are inspired, um, and otherwise we might talk about it more once it's live and people can kind of uh, interact with it. And so for, for the listeners, what can you do for better sense making? Well, one thing is if there are whole chunks of populations that you only have pejorative straw man versions of where you can't explain why they think what they think without making them dumb or bad, you should be dubious of your own modeling. Uh, St. Francis's seek first to understand, you should seek harder to take in the news that they're taking in for a week, right? For a day. Um, go to Mother Jones for a day if you're on the right. Go to Breitbart for a day. Take it in and try to seek if I'm continuously getting this and I, what are the issues that I face as a being if I really put myself in that person's shoes. And it's not just so you can empathize with the dumb people, it's that there's some actual signal that you might have been missing doesn't mean that it's all signal, there's also noise. Most all of the positions right now have some signal and a bunch of noise. So we wanna be able to seek to understand so we can actually get the other humans that we need to be able to coordinate with and that we can get the parts of signal. We can be able to see where there's signal and noise and we can start to synthesize the signal across the space, right? That is a movement towards adequate sense-making or synthesis. So yeah, if you feel a combination of outraged and outraged, scared, you know, emotional and very certain with a strong kind of enemy hypothesis orientation. You have been captured by somebody's narrative warfare and you think it's your own thinking. And that will, even if you win at a local battle, whatever technologies you use to win, whatever social tech or infotech or whatever you use to win, the other side will reverse engineer and come back and you're just escalating an arms race. You're not moving towards real shared sense making and coordination. That's one thing I would say. This doesn't mean you never take a position. It means that you take a position that is trying not to just continue warfare, but trying to elevate the whole space, which requires me understanding the whole space better. I would say that one of the ways to do that is you know, I don't have social media apps on my phone. I think that's just a dumb idea. I don't think any, anyone should say, yeah, I can take the most addictive drugs regularly and not get addicted. Um, so I don't have them there. I do have them on my computer. I'm cognizant around limiting my time and engagement, but I've also curated it where I know what it is. I know that it's not a, just a benign tool. I know it is a AI empowered agent seeking to affect my behavior. And so how do I uh, relate to that better? So I intentionally went and followed, I took all the major positions, extreme left, moderate left, ex moderate right, extreme right, conspiracy, the Chinese views, the R Russian views, et cetera, and I followed all of them, right? Followed all those news sources, followed the thought leaders in them, and made sure that I had a pretty good distribution. So Facebook's algorithm is very confused by me, right? And the other kinds of algorithms, because I wanted to see that I was not getting an echo chamber. When I use Facebook, I'm, I mostly don't state things. I put out questions. One of the reasons that I put out questions is because the people that, I also friended people who have almost every view. And so many people in this environment have said, if you believe such and such, unfriend me, or I'm unfriending you. So they're doubling down on their tiny little tribalist groupthink, right? Because the other people are such a dumb, terrible, bad people that I don't even want to be friends with you and see your nonsense. This is not how you influence the world effectively. And so I've intentionally friended people across the space and followed them so they also see my stuff. So the comment thread will not be a filter bubble. It'll be some extreme right and some extreme left and some various kinds of views. And someone can say, well, how dare you amplify such and such? Because if you don't understand what swaths of humanity is thinking, your ability to influence humanity is very poor. Your ability to even understand it is very poor. So then I ask the question, so as to hopefully break filter bubbles if someone reads the comment thread and is exposed to things that they aren't exposed to on their own newsfeed. Um, to at least maybe inspire 
some people to look at something else. Now, unfortunately, almost everyone who comments, even if they hold different views, share such poor quality comments because they're just they're triggered and oriented to do some kind of limbic hijacked thing that they don't even make a constructive enough argument that it's all that compelling. This is one of the other things you'll notice is that we're not compelled by stuff because we did formal epistemology and propositional logic on it. We're compelled because it feels truthy to us um, or feels consequential. And so like if you'll notice that the stuff that feels so obviously true to you feels obviously true to people who already believe what you believe and feels obviously not true to the other people. When you put it out, they instantly see it as propaganda gibberish, right? And so that's not communicating. That's just doubling down on groupthink and tribalism. And so, but it's interesting to see why is it that it's and good to certain people and feels just like stupid and evil to other people. Why does it feel that different way? Well, if I pay attention to the media environment that they're taking in, feels true is largely resonant with what they've taken in so far, right? Like that's a big part of it. So um, one of the things that I do on an issue is, let's say I want to make sense of police violence in the US, or I wanna make sense of the Beirut blast or the India-China border or whatever it is. As far as narratives go, there's not one narrative. There's usually, there's usually not even two narratives. There might be five or seven or 11 different kind of narrative clusters. There might be a hundred versions, but they fall within general clusters. And so what I'll usually try to do is do a landscape of what the narrative clusters are first. And then I'll try to steel man each narrative. Like what is the strongest version of arguing that thing that I've been able to see? So look for the best thinkers that are representative of those narratives. That's helpful for me to both see the signal that they got because that, the collective intelligence of those people doesn't have no signal. It also helps me understand why they think what they think, which also helps me understand how to maybe communicate and, and relate. But that doesn't mean that I agree with all of it. It means that I'm seeking to understand it, right? So then the next thing I want to do is after I've done that, which is a kind of interpersonal intelligence seeking to understand the narrative, then I want to do a kind of empirical or objective intelligence and break the narrative into individual propositions. And typically, even framed in the question are assumptions and presuppositions that are actually propositions. So use propositional logic and break it into individual propositions. And I say, what evidence have they put forward to support each of these propositions? And typically it's like, I'll break a complex narrative into like 50 propositions and there's maybe evidence for like four of them. And it's usually like maybe strong evidence for two and kind of weak for four and then a bunch of just emotional leaps, logical leaps. So then I'll say, what additional evidence can I get that will either verify or falsify, or at least support or uh, decrease the likelihood for any of these? And where are there ones that I can neither verify nor falsify and should just sit as, they, this was just a filler someone put in, but I have no basis for certainty whatsoever. I have to be comfortable with uncertainty to be able to make sense of it, or I will try to jump to false certainties. Then I have to not only seek to verify and falsify each of those parts, because most likely there's a few true parts, a few nonsense parts, and a bunch of filler, right? And that's true across the whole narrative space. So then I also have to seek to do this across the other narratives. So this is important because most people are jumping to what is true very much not through a epistemic or logical process. Even if they think it is, what they if they really break it down propositionally, they'll find that they had a logical process of this seems true and this seems true, therefore, and the therefore has like eight logical leaps in it. Um, so basically, these are a few steps that I would encourage for people on their own to be dubious of their own certainty and outrage, to seek to understand the narrative landscape better, to seek empiricism better, to try to be able to not reject or take entire narratives, but be able to look for partial truths, to be able to try to aggregate signal across the space, 
to be way more comfortable with uncertainty. And that's uncomfortable in a way to say, I don't understand the world I live in. Even in the most consequential areas, I just don't understand it. At least that, I actually feel safer because I know that I don't have confirmation bias making me understand it wrongly. I at least have a chance to increase my understanding when I say I don't know, because the moment I think that I falsely know, now I, I'm not even gonna be able to learn well, right? So these are some examples of things. And then in addition to reading across the space, actually seek the more um, well-grounded and complex views as opposed to the more trending ones. Uh, I want to find the thinkers that seem most earnest and most well kind of educated and thoughtful across the space. And then I wanna see where people who have deep expertise and earnestness disagree, and then I wanna explore the basis of the disagreement. So just a few basic principles, and we've talked about this, you've, you've had other uh, whole videos on sense-making practices, but these are a few basic things. The reason why I feel compelled to say this is because we were getting into the project we're gonna do, and the project we're working on by no means can do everything, and it doesn't exist up yet. Um, so I want the first thing to be empowering people to work on on their own. So the thing that we're doing is trying to do something like uh, a better version of the fourth estate, a better version of news that is relevant to the actual information landscape of the current moment, and the critical aspects of education that people didn't get that are most helpful for them to be able to understand uh, and sense make the world better on their own. And we didn't actually start off thinking that we'd be doing something like news or media. We started out thinking that we were doing something like the kind of intelligence and research work to be able to understand the escalation pathways to catastrophic risk. So we were working on getting a much better sense of supply chain fragilities and food security issues and uh, the escalation pathways to different kinds of war. And, and that, that's not just at a theoretical level, but having to get a lot of detailed info about what's really going on on the ground to know where the actual escalation pathways and those types of things are. As we were, and that was to inform strategic kinds of interventions that could really help address it. To be able to address it, you're gonna to talk to people who are in decision-making positions and share information with them to hopefully try to influence them in different ways. And so we had the opportunity to do that and speak to people in, in high-level uh, public and private uh, influence positions and prepare information for them. And the information we were preparing, the kind of uh, briefings of those type, take a tremendous amount of very skilled people's time to create actionable intel for someone who can make choices that are quite consequential. And we were able to see that we could actually provide pretty novel insights in a number of areas because we weren't looking at the global issues in um, specialized siloed ways where a lot of say, you know, the issues are more complex than the institutional structures were designed for. And so you would have CDC looking at you know, disease type risks and these kind of military groups looking at these kinds of uh, terrorism risks and these groups looking at cyber risks. And, but we see a world where something can start in one area and start to cascade across them. And so looking at the interconnection of them is actually critical to understand uh, the world well. So we were looking at taking a, um, a deeply kind of interdisciplinary and trans narrative perspective on this that actually resulted in um, novel insights into a bunch of spaces. And one of the things that started to occur during that was this is actually what news should be. Like high level intelligence briefings, some things should be national security or whatever. But um, the idea of a decision maker who gets a lot of information processing is a fundamentally anti-democratic idea, right? A democratic idea would be everyone can possibly be a significant decision maker, hopefully is actually more involved in the processes of being able to influence. But the basis of being able to make good choices is the information processing, not the information access. This is a key thing. A lot of people will share this idea that I can pull up my smartphone and have access to more total information than the president had 20 years ago, and so we've democratized information access. This is kind of a gibberish story, because even though in one way it's true, 
I can't read the billion search results on anything, and I don't know where the really relevant stuff is, and I can't process you know, all of the information. So it's not access to information, it's access to information processing to inform actionable intel that is really relevant, and there's an unbelievable asymmetry of that. If you look at the top kind of trading funds, algorithmic trading funds, and you look at the kind of financial market intel in information processing, not just information access. Yes, they have information access you don't have of lots of different kinds of things behind paywalls and privileged information. But then they also have massive AIs that are processing, doing machine learning on tremendous databases of stuff to be able to um, high speed trade bundles of complex financial instruments that front run you know, other uh, groups. Compared to the average person's ability to understand the market, we might be talking about like 10 orders of magnitude information processing difference. And the same is true when it comes to you know, all different aspects of power and intelligence. So to really be able to support a, an emergence of something like a democratic process, participatory governance, the information access and information processing to be able to understand the issues well enough to know what good informed action looks like is prerequisite. And so we started thinking, well, can we, can we make things like this as the news? And at the same time, one of the risks that we were seeing that was driving all of the other catastrophic risks the fastest was the news landscape. And I don't just mean the few large news channels, I mean the media landscape that is the Facebook issues we were talking about and you know all the YouTube recommendation algorithms plus the nature of the news and all like that. And we were seeing that you know people being willing to go up in arms over uh, mask wearing or shutdown or hydroxychloroquine or uh, systemic race issues mostly are from things they saw on their screen, not things that they experienced directly in their town. So the, the nature of what was happening in the media space was actually driving the breakdown of society faster than anything else was. Because in the movement from conventional to unconventional warfare, the bottom of the stack is economic warfare. That's where the real resource power comes. The back of the stack that backs it up at the end of the day if it has to is kinetic warfare, guns and stuff. But the front of it, where the fastest rate of change is occurring, is the narrative and info warfare that is being fought in people's minds, for people's minds, right? For uh, the, the control of pop population. And so if we could do something to just even slow down the rate of polarization and radicalization, just take some of the pollution out of the narrative and info space, if we could show the narrative and info weapons, because they only work as well when they're covert, when they're made overt, when you get to see how the different types of spin work and how the different kinds of data manipulation work, people can start recognizing them more and recognizing how they're being affected by them and be affected less, at least have the possibility of engagement with it. <clears throat> and then, if you can start having even a small group of people who are really endeavoring to and getting the skills to and the information processing support to understand the world much better, plus have much higher quality conversation with each other, that group starts to have a collective intelligence that really is asymmetric to most of the rest of the population that can start coming up with better solutions and become a strange attractor, which is the beginning of drive a cultural enlightenment that can re-instantiate the possibility of participatory coordination and govern governance. And so the current thing that we're building that will almost certainly not be what it ends up being as we see what do people really respond to and what gets traction, has a few different kinds of information products together. One is something that is like news, meaning addressing critical current events. and. You know, if you look at big news organizations, they're huge organizations, right? Like it's a lot of resource to try to do that. You know, you've worked at BBC and big organizations. Uh, and so if you, for most people, they would actually be best supported by having very good local news because they could, if they could actually make better sense of their local world, they would have more agency to do stuff about it. But local news across everywhere is just an unbelievably tremendous job, right? Um, tremendously large job. And being able to have um, news that is kind of Eurocentric and Asian-centric and whatever and across all the sectors is a lot. So the, rather than pick like one domain that we're starting in, we're starting with uh, 
the most consequential things across areas from a global perspective with a somewhat US-centric audience. We have to pick somewhere to start. So what that means is domestic politics and geopolitics and economies and markets, culture, technology, environment, uh, military, all of those things where we're looking at what are the things that we believe are tier one consequential in terms of how much they can change the overall uh, nature of life in the world you know, in the coming years and decades. And uh, being able to present that in the form of what look like briefings across you know, this week in the, the happenings that happened that are of top consequence that doesn't have, and you know, we're, we don't have on the ground report networks that are anywhere near as robust as we want. We're working on building those out, but largely we're looking at groups that are reporting on it and being able to look across the whole space and be able to say factoring left and right and different countries' perspectives and do that kind of synthesis, what is the clearest thing that we can say with confidence? And so we're looking at things that are maximally consequential and what we can say with confidence that actually is calibrated from a kind of formal process that is trans ideology, trans narrative, rather than supporting a particular political agenda or economic agenda. And it's designed to be a second simplicity, meaning a lot of complexity of research goes into it, but it's actually as simple to understand as possible. So there's a low barrier of entry of starting to get something that doesn't have narrative spin or info manipulation in it. Now, if someone wants to go deeper and someone could easily ask, well, why would I trust that as opposed to anything else? We would say, you're not trusting us because we're a particular authority. We're hoping that you trust your own sense making progressively better. And we're showing you in detail, transparently, how we do our sense making. So how we currently have it structured is that someone can see that briefing. And then one of the, there's different places they can go to go deeper. One of them is a under the hood feature where they can see the epistemic process, the sense making process we used to come up with that. So what things did we read and look at? What data sets did we include? What data sets did we say we had low confidence in and decided to throw out or put a discount rate on? And what epistemic frames did we use? And so if someone wants to see that, they can. So now this is them also learning how are we making sense of the world. So they can both give us feedback on, hey, I think you misweighted this data set or there's this other data set or frame. Awesome. But they can also be learning, I guess I could have done that. I could have looked at all of those sources. I could have applied these frames. I didn't even know some of those frames now that I know them. So they're increasing in their own sense-making capacity by seeing how we're doing it. Of course, we also uh, want to show retrospectives of where we made forecasts or said what was going on, where we later found out that we were wrong or right, or get to show here's where we were wrong, here's where we were right, where we were wrong, how are we updating our models? So really good transparency and earnestness in that whole process. Also, so you can do the kind of under the hood thing, you can also do the meta news thing. The meta news is, okay, so here's what we were able to find out about this topic. But that sounds different than what you read in the New York Times or the Atlantic or Breitbart or Mother Jones or RT or whatever other place you're looking at. What, what do they say? Why do they say that? Why did we come up with something different? What is our assessment of what they came up with? So this is actually, and of course, we're not going to be able to do that for all news sources, right? We, we've already looked at about 1,500 news sources in our curation process. We kind of have to collapse those to ones that cluster in a similar type of narrative and then pick you know, some of the better exemplars of those and say, okay, so here's the narrative landscape. We'll go ahead and steel man that narrative landscape, and then we will break it down into individual propositions and say, what can we verify? What can we falsify? So we are helping people to understand the world through more of the lenses, understand why people, other people think what they think, even have a clear sense of it, then also understand how to empirically validate these things. Then we also show the narrative and info weapons. So we'll say, okay, so in this piece here, Here's the original piece of science that they were quoting, or the original video or that they were referencing, but then here's the way they framed it. This is Lakoff framing, this is a kind of spin. Now that same thing is, has spin on it over here that's of a different type. So let's explain the concept of Lakoff framing and spin, and, or Russell conjugation, or those kinds of narrative weapons, and say, look for these everywhere. right? And this isn't the left saying the right news is fake, or the right saying the left news is fake, this is saying, Everyone who's playing the narrative game is subject to some of the same pressures, and these are some of the tools that get used, so look for them. And also, there's some signal in all of these places. So we're not coming out as the, this is fake news, but 
there is some signal, let's try to verify it, and there is some distortion. So the goal in the meta news is that someone doesn't hear what we say and say, okay, well, that's just one other narrative with lots of narratives, that they actually get to see all the narratives and they get to see how we're making sense of them and they get to also apply their own capacity to make sense of them. And we make explicit the narrative and info weapons so that people can recognize them more on their own. And by also, by reifying the true parts and being able to say where something is either clearly falsifiable or we just can neither verify nor falsify, it's just conjecture or spin, we hopefully help people neither just accept nor reject any standard narrative, but be able to take a more rigorous and nuanced view across all of them. Then, of course, there's places where to understand what's going on, there's education that people need for frames, right? Like they need some history around this India-China border conflict, or they need to understand certain things around why the high altitude place where the watershed is and missile defense and whatever would be the strategic targets they are. Or um, So we'll also do either curate, if there's a perfect educational piece that really does a very good job, or a few, we'll curate those, but we'll also create pieces that provide the critical aspects of education that pe most people didn't get. And where we also try to do kind of a Pareto optimization on this. So it's like, say we're talking here about the Facebook issues and there's stuff trending in the news around what's happening with fake news and Facebook and whatever. So if someone's read Marshall McLuhan, they're gonna understand things about media theory that other people aren't gonna have, but not everybody's gonna go read McLuhan. And we wanna be able to reference McLuhan for media theory, but also Lakoff for media theory, and then Girard for conflict theory and other types of conflict theory, and Baudrillard for institutional decay, but also Strauss Howe and Tainter for institutional decay. There's a lot of things where those epistemic frames give you the ability to understand stuff better, but people aren't gonna go read all those books. So can we take the critical model that gives a lot of help in that book and make a three or 10 page essay that kind of gives the most epistemic reifying power in the mo easiest information compression? And say, if you wanna read the whole book, please do. Otherwise, here's at least some basic stuff. Similar with the history pieces and the context pieces. So this is hoping to be able to give it easy, low barrier of entry overview of critical things with progressively deeper capacities to learn sense-making and epistemology and the kinds of background necessary to understand the world better. Now this is, in a way, this is like a big project and ambitious. In another way, it's just trying to do broadcast news and education right, right? Um, which is almost going back to something. Uh, so the decentralized aspect, because it's centralized, right? Uh, the, the Wikipedia thing is hard to control, but you can control for a smaller team of people that have really quality epistemics and um, knowledge process. And we've been able to bring together a really exceptional team and are continuing to look for and grow that. It's actually hard to find people who can do this because like, to, to do the core sense-making work, we need people who are capable of doing two things well. One is trans-narrative, right? That they are not so emotionally captured by a particular narrative that they can actually do a really good job of steel manning all of the narratives. And, so that's kind of a intersubjective intelligence. Um, and then on the objective side, we need people who can do empiricism well across, it, in an interdisciplinary way, across multiple disciplines. Because if I want to understand almost any of these issues, the lens of finance is critical, but not sufficient. The lens of culture is critical, but not sufficient. The lens of um, narrative warfare or politics or whatever. So there's quite a lot of environmental psychology or infrastructure. There's a lot of different specialty domains that need to be factored. So there's a lot of narratives and a lot of epistemologies. So we're looking for people internally who can do uh, interdisciplinary and trans-narrative thinking. So then, of course, people who are specialists or do hold a particular ideology can give input, but we can take the input across those spaces and try to do analysis and then synthesis on it. The decentralized sense-making is something that we want to experiment with. We're actually, um, yeah, looking at being able to uh, crowdsource different projects and be able to help upregulate some of the right ones. And you know, even where you have articles that have forums, K 
can we experiment with architectures in the forum that incent both higher quality sense making and higher quality conversation, where those are the things that get upregulated? Um, I think we can, and we have uh, a number of kind of ideas on how to make architectures that really incent that, social architectures built in the di digital space. And so the hope here is that, let's say that it's a small percentage of the total audience that spends a lot of time and that really has the high epistemic drive and capacity to sense make very well. Well, even if it's a small percentage of the total audience, some of those people are in everybody's friend group, almost everybody's friend group, almost every major Facebook group or social network. If those people have really good data sources, much better epistemology, things that are addressing well all of the sides of various things, and they're learning how to do dialectic and steel manning well, they can start to influence the spaces they're in to be able to do better sense making. Oftentimes, the people who have best sense making are also employed by the people who are in top institutional positions of power as strategists and analysts and whatever to be able to influence those things. So um, basically, the information commons is not being stewarded. We're trying to do something to start stewarding the information commons and to make that a strange attractor of more things that will start to do that. That's why this is a nonprofit project is we're not willing to ever put ads on and we're not willing to put it behind a paywall that makes it not accessible to everyone. To really democratize the access to the, that quality of information processing has to be freely available to everyone. We also aren't willing to take any nonprofit funds that have any strings attached. Um, so it has to be people that actually believe that increasing decentralized collective intelligence is net good for the world and authentically want to support that as a commons project. And that's, you know, what we're seeking right now is people who either, like, if there are people who would want to put capital into that, that's a timely need. If there are people who have really exceptional um, analytic capabilities or access to really novel kind of source of information or data sets, or have worked on machine deep learning types of technologies for sense making, those are the kinds of uh, connections and alliances that would be, would say, re reach out if you're aligned. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Mushow Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>